invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. We're going to be finishing up this first chapter of Ephesians this morning. And uh, before we jump into the text, I wanted to read a quote by uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones about this passage. He said this, The apostle is emphasizing the power of God in us. Here, the grand object the apostle has in mind is to make the Ephesians see and realize, and us with them, that he, what he is doing in us. The result would be that our fears would vanquish and we would have new confidence and assurance with respect to our salvation. This topic of assurance of salvation seems to be one, as I've been in pastoral ministry for over 10 years now, that is constantly coming up. Um, it's something that when I was in Missouri and I was working with youth in Missouri came up on a regular basis. It's something that I've encountered here as I've pastored here at Arbor Drive on a continual basis. It's the question of how do I know? How can I be sure? What, what is it that I can hang my hat on, so to speak, that keeps me in the grip of salvation and keeps me from being lost, right? And, and a lot of how we view our assurance of salvation flows out of how we view our salvation. Um, if my salvation is up to me, then it is also up to me to keep it. And that, that leads to a very difficult, a very tenuous place where uh, I, was, uh, I was not a Christian one moment, and then I, of my own volition and my own power, decided to be a Christian. Well, that means that of my own volition and power, I can decide not to be a Christian. What, what keeps that from changing? Yet, if we go back to the beginning of Ephesians and we see all that Paul has been saying about our salvation, what, what he follows with and what we're going to read today in verses 19 to 23 is really just sort of icing on the cake that gives us a, a deeper grounding in assurance, right? Like if, if we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing because he chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, if he has predestined us for adoption, if we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, if in chapter 2, as we'll reference here in a minute, but if in ch as in chapter 2 it says, you were dead, but God, being rich in mercy, made you alive together with Christ. If that's what salvation is, then you have a ground and a basis for confidence in that salvation because it doesn't rest in you. It rests in God's power and God's work and his activity on our behalf. And if you follow that thread, you logically get to where, where Paul ends up today. At the end of this chapter, in the, at the end of this prayer for the Ephesians. So he's already prayed that, they, that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, that he, he, he gives thanks for them, that they would have spiritual wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, he's praying that the Ephesians and us as believers would know God, not just know about him, but would know him. That we would have fellowship with him, that we would have the eyes of our heart enlightened. So when you come to faith, when, when you are born again, something happens and spiritual blindness is replaced by spiritual sight, right? The, one, of the, one of the ways that we can talk about salvation is having the eyes of our heart enlightened, opened, right? But there's a continual need for that in our lives, Right? We don't just, it's not a once and done thing. It's not like, oh, okay, I, you know, I was blind, but now I see. There we go. Now I'm just going to take seeing for granted. It's like, no, he's wanting us to see more. He's wanting us to see deeper with the eyes of our heart. He's wanting us to pursue this fellowship with God in richer and deeper and fuller ways for the rest of our lives. And he's praying that God would do this work in us. So he has been praying for the church that we would know the hope to which we are called and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. 
Now, I want to stop and consider something real quick. I doubt that there is one of us in this room who has not struggled at one point or another with assurance of salvation. And this normally comes, this was an uh, observation that Lloyd-Jones had that I thought was really profound. And, and I think it would be really helpful for us to grasp this. That normally comes because we see two things at the same time. We get a glimpse of the glory of our hope, and at the same time, immediately are reminded of our own sinfulness. We, see, we catch a glimpse of the glory of heaven, the glory of Christ, the beauty, the majesty of eternity with Christ, and then at the same time, we are reminded of our sinfulness and our unfitness for that. And then we begin to ask the question, well, how then can we be there? How can a sinful person, how can somebody that, and, and you don't even need to, you don't even need to, to go beyond um, and, and ask other people, you are acutely aware of your own shortcomings, right? I mean, some of us are way harder on ourselves than, than we should be. Um, and some of us kind of just ignore our, our own shortcomings and try to pretend like they don't exist, right? But we're all acutely aware of them. We realize how prone we are to selfishness. We realize how prone we are to wander. We realize how, how uh, it was a, um, sorry, there was that, that uh, movie Up that, that uh, is, is like a Pixar movie, Up, and there's a dog that gets a collar that allows him to talk. I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> See, I was looking in the wrong place. I was looking at Patty. I thought Patty would get me on this one. Uh, and so he's talking, and then all of a sudden he sees a squirrel. He goes, squirrel, and he goes and chases it, right? If, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that that is our our constant struggle. We are constant. Like, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. I want him to be Lord of my life. I want to honor him with everything squirrel. Right? I, and we, we constantly do this. And, and so, like, that's what Lloyd-Jones is saying. He's saying, like, this causes us to fall into despair and to question our security and question our salvation because, like, how can somebody that's constantly chasing these squirrels when we know that Christ is infinitely worthy of all honor, all praise, all glory, all of our lives, how can this person who's unfit for heaven be made fit for heaven? And, and that is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that he makes us fit for heaven, that he makes us righteous, that he stands in our place, that Christ stands in our place as our substitute, and dies for us. May, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. Now, I promise we're getting to the text. <laughs> the question still remains, though, what about this interim period? Right? I'm, I'm positionally righteous before God. Right? I'm made righteous. I'm counted as righteous, but I'm not practically righteous in my life. There are all sorts of unrighteous things that I struggle with on a regular basis. So there's this interim between when I'm saved and when Christ returns or when I die. And what, what about that? Like, what's my, what's my hope? Like, it would be one thing if I was saved and then immediately died and went to be with him. Everything's forgiven. I'm good to go, right? Well, the answer comes in these final verses of chapter 1, and the answer is God's immeasurable power. That is the only thing that keeps you. That is the only hope that we have as Christians, God's immeasurable power. So let's read the word of the Lord from Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. And what is the immeasurable power or the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand, or at his right hand, in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
there's four demonstrations of God's power that lead to security and confidence for a believer in these verses. The first one is in verse 19, which is God's saving power. He says in verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which you were called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So the first thing we see is the scope of his power, immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. Now, here's the important thing to notice. If you take nothing else from this, notice who is the active agent. Whose power is it? Whose might is it? Whose keeping, saving power is it? We often overestimate our own power and underestimate God's, especially when it comes to salvation. If we want to have a confidence, we need to first understand the nature of our salvation. It was not something that was insignificant. It was not something that anyone could have done. It was not something that was easy to accomplish. Our salvation is nothing short of a miracle that demonstrates God's power. Every person that is saved, you, like, we get so wrapped around the ax axle of like, man, we, in the Old Testament, God parted the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry land. Imagine what that must have been like. Imagine how, right? Oh, my goodness. And then what happened? Like, 40 days later, they're like, oh, we want to go back to Egypt. You know, at least we had food there. Like, that was nothing compared to the work of the Holy Spirit in regenerating a heart and changing a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. In fact, in the Old Testament, it says that the days are coming when it will no longer be said the God who led us out of Egypt. In other words, God's deliverance of the Israelites from, from Egypt in the Exodus was the main saving work of the Old Testament. It was the prototypical saving work that pointed forward to a greater salvation that would come in Christ. It was the biggest demonstration of God's power in the Old Testament. Greater than, than, uh, than Elijah and the priests of Baal, greater than anything else was God defeating the, the, um, the armies of Pharaoh and leading his people safely across the, uh, or through the Red Sea to the promised land, right? And, and what, the, what, the, what the Old Testament writer is saying is that that is going to pale in comparison to what God is going to do salvation-wise in the future. It's not even going to be the thing that's, that's mentioned anymore. It's going to be eclipsed. Every salvation is a miracle. It's a miracle that no one in this world could replicate because it requires immeasurable greatness of power to be displayed. Think about that. The power that God has to have to overcome stubborn, hard, dead, cold, stony hearts and breathe life into them. It is the same power that breathed life into the first man, Adam. Right? In creation, it says that God formed him and breathed the breath of life into him. That is the power of our God. Many people will think salvation is special, even spectacular, but miraculous. Maybe it's because it seems so common that we find it difficult to believe that it is miraculous. In the next chapter, Paul's going to illustrate God's power in salvation by talking about who we were, right? You were dead. You were slaves. And then he's going to say, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, even while we were dead in sin, made us alive together with Christ. That is, our salvation is a work of God and displays his power from start to finish. So this means that we weren't easier to save because we were a bit better than someone to the left or the right. 
We were all separated from God. We were all alienated. We were all dead. We were all slaves. We were all under wrath. We were all without hope. And as we'll see in the next chapter, God overcomes that. He defeats that by saving us. So we need to first see that God's power is demonstrated in our salvation, the gospel saving us. That's what Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. No one, therefore, is beyond the saving power of the gospel. No one is too far gone to be brought safely into the family of God. No child is so wayward that he or she is beyond the reach of the power of the gospel. That includes you and I when we wander. Our salvation is a work and uh, and demonstration of God's power. So he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. That's the first basis for any sort of assurance. God's power in your salvation. Here's the second one. God's sanctifying power. God's sanctifying power. We see that in verse 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand, at his right hand, in the heavenly places. Paul is saying that by raising Christ from the grave, God has given the public demonstration and affirmation that the final enemy of death and sin have been defeated. That's what the resurrection is. Jesus and the Old Testament predicted the resurrection. We're gonna, if, if you're in Sunday school, this is like you're going to talk about this next week. But for right now, if you're not in Sunday school, you need to understand that the resurrection is not just like an Easter Sunday thing. It's actually an integral part of the gospel. It's, it's I think, the most left out part of the gospel. Oh, we love that he died, but he actually rose again. And that's really, really important. (laughs) Like, that's a big part of the gospel, uh, as is the part that he's coming back. So when when he died, he didn't, it didn't just like poof. Oh man, what happened? I did not anticipate this at all. I thought I was just going to live a long, happy life of doing ministry until I was 60 or 70 and die of, you know, that, that was not the plan. The plan was always for Christ to go to the cross and for him to be raised from the dead. And we know this because he predicted it. Remember when Jesus was talking to, uh, to his disciples and the people around him and he was by the temple? And he says, destroy this temple. He said, that was an East Coast thing. He says, uh, he said, destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. And everybody stopped and started looking around at one another like, what is this guy talking about? It took us 46 years to build this place. How in the world is he going to rebuild this in three days? There's no way. This guy's off his rocker. 46 years. They thought he was talking about a physical building. Now the question, which is, is this, which is a greater display of power? Would it be a greater display of power for him to rebuild a physical structure that took 46 years in three days? Or would it be a greater display of power for him to raise from the dead and for his body to be made new, brought to life from death in three days? You see, they were missing the forest for the trees. They thought they, what, what they were focusing on seemed impossible. And if they had any concept of what he was really talking about, it would have been really impossible. That's the power of God. Sometimes I fear we're so familiar with things like the resurrection that we're inoculated to it. So let me give you an example of this. um, When I was a kid, I had a little bunny. I liked this bunny. And this bunny, I can, I could, you didn't think I'd have a bunny as a kid? Well, the bunny, I thought that would be fun for the bunny to play with the German Shepherd. And the German Shepherd was super sweet, but she played a little rougher than the bunny did and broke his neck. And so I put him in the cage, and I remember this vividly. And it was, it was little cages in my room, and I remember sitting by the, the cage, praying for like 30 or 40 minutes. It had to have been 30 or 40 minutes, praying that God would bring this bunny back to life. 
like praying for resu- uh, resurrection. And, and I, I, I prayed, and I was like, maybe I've prayed for long enough. Maybe, maybe God has answered this prayer with a yes. And I very tentatively reached in and grabbed the bunny, and he just stone cold, stiff as a board. Nope. Didn't raise this one from the dead. All right, so we went out and buried him. Like, we're so familiar with this resurrection concept. And, and it seemed like such a common thing that I was like, well, this should happen all the time, right? But what I didn't understand is like, what was the power that went into the resurrection? What was the purpose of it? What, what was going on there? I, I was, I was, um, I just kind of expected this to be normal and it's not, it's supernatural. It's a demonstration of the power of God over sin and death and nothing less than that. Now, if, if Christ has that kind of power, if he rose from the dead conquering sin and death, is there anything in your life that is greater than that power? If he rose from the dead conquering sin and death, what do you have in your life that can hold sway over him? What do you have in your life that can defeat that kind of power? He defeated everything that had any power over you. Is there anything that he cannot overcome? Is there any failure in your life too great for him to defeat? In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that if there's no resurrection, we're without hope in this world. In Ephesians 1, Paul wants us to know the hope that we have, and then it makes sense then that he would connect it with the resurrection and the power of the resurrection, because our hope is tied to a risen Savior. The same power that resurrected Christ will bring new life to our mortal bodies and transform them to be fit for heaven. You see, the problem is that we think that we're going to go to heaven as we are. And just like the world was created to fit humanity, the world will be recreated and we will be recreated to fit it. There's, the reason that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth is because heaven or because earth has been decayed by human failure and sin. It's going to require a new earth, a perfect earth to fit our perfect bodies, which means that we are going to be resurrected and be like Christ. No more sin, no more decay, no more pain, no more sorrow. And all of that is true and glorious. But what about now? Right? Do we just, is this just a future hope? The power that rose Christ from the dead should be seen in our lives as Christians now. The three great adversaries of the Christian are the flesh, the devil, and worldliness, and they are all defeated by a risen Christ. The world constantly bombards us with its values. Constantly. We get that through movies, radio, television, magazines, social pressure. How many of us take our cues from the world and become captives of worldliness without even realizing it? We're taken captive by the world's values and the world's priorities. Yet it is the power of God that rose Jesus from the dead that is available to us as Christians to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12. And so, like, I can't make you want to be less worldly. I can't make myself want to be less worldly. Where I can want to be less worldly, but then I struggle with the actual being less worldly part. I can't force myself to be less in love with the world. What has to happen is there has to be a greater love for Christ that grows in me. And the only way that happens is through a risen Savior's power at work in my heart. It takes a supernatural power to turn your affections to where you value and love different things and thus are not conformed to the world. So this is just not relevant to our future resurrection. It's relevant now. The resurrection power is what makes us new creations and enables us to live as new creatures. 
What about the flesh? In biblical language, it means our sinful nature. The flesh is powerful, right? I mean, we get sucked by the flesh into inactivity and wasting our time. It locks us into sinful patterns of behavior. It causes us to lust after carnal desires. And yet it's only the power of the resurrection from the dead that makes us new creations and gives us a new nature that can overcome the flesh. So the flesh is powerful. God is more powerful. What about Satan? You have to be careful here because... um, we're perfectly capable of being worldly and fleshly without him and without his help, right? So there's some people that want to blame everything on the devil. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the water boy, but I call it the water boy syndrome. My mama said that the, it's such and such is the devil. Like, devil's in everything, right? That's a, that's a southern thing. Oh, the devil. Um, Yet, there are other people that want to discount the devil's activity, discount Satan's activity in this world. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, as we'll see in the next chapter. But listen, okay? Think back to Job. If there's one lesson that you take from Job, it's this. Satan is a created being who's on a leash. His creator determines his boundaries. He is not all-powerful. The one who holds the leash is all-powerful. God is the one who says, have you considered my servant Job? You can do all sorts of stuff to him. You just can't kill him. So Satan operates under the authority of God, under the power of God. He is not more powerful than God. And that means that this resurrected Savior who defeated death and defeated Satan has, is placing him under his foot. I mean, isn't that the promise of Genesis chapter 3? I will put enmity between you and the serpent, between your offspring and his offspring. He shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush his head. Right? The risen Savior crushed the head of the serpent. Took the power away. And now, especially for us who are liberated, and brought into the family of God. We live with a new power within us that is enabling us. And that is why Ephesians 6 says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then he instructs us to put on the armor of God. It's God's power clothing us, protecting us, and enabling us. So the second basis for assurance is God's sanctifying power. The third one is God's sovereign power. We see that in verses 20 to 21. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only this age, but also in the age to come. God's power was not exhausted in the resurrection. He exalted his son. His power brought Christ up and seated him in the heavenly realms. Christ's rule over all includes all. Right? We, uh, um, Nick read it to us. The, the path to exaltation was humiliation and humility. He came and humbled himself taking on the form of a servant and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is sovereign power. He is in control of everything. Nothing outside of his purview or authority. Christ's rule and reign is expansive, it's extensive, it reaches to the farthest uh, atoms in the universe and into the smallest microseconds of our lives. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, what did he say? All authority has been given to me in heaven 
and on earth. There is no higher court of appeal. There is no greater magistrate. There is no seat that is higher. Christ occupies the throne above every throne. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. So while we don't struggle against the flesh and blood, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, we also don't struggle alone because Christ has been set above everyone and everything. So as James says, he says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There are two elements there. The first one is rightly ordering yourself before God and then moving forward correctly as you are rightly ordered before God. The first step is to submit yourself to God. Rightly order yourself before God. Um, Here's the... Here's the... Be careful here. We have lived in a culture for many, many, many years that has said... You can submit yourself to God on Sunday morning for a few hours, but he requires nothing of you the rest of the week. You give him the morning on Sunday, you get six and a half days the rest of the week to be your own person, to do your own thing. That is not Christianity. That is a false sense of security, and no wonder so many people that live that way have no assurance of salvation. How can you have assurance of salvation when one of the main evidences of faith is submission to Christ as your Lord in every area of your life? Rightly ordering yourself under God as his subject, as as his servant who has claim and authority over everything from your bad attitude to your bad decision, all of it. He has the right to say, nope, that's the wrong direction. And then once we've rightly ordered ourselves under him, then we can actually move forward and resist the devil and have him flee from us, right? The devil's not going to flee from us if there's no power backing us. And there's no power backing us if we're not submitting to God. God doesn't work that way. He, he doesn't stand there and be like, okay, well, you do this on your own, but I'm still, I'm still going to, I got you, right? His power is active in us as we submit to him and rightly order ourselves under his authority. The point that Paul is making is that Christ is above everything and he has claim on you and no one can take you away and no one can make a greater claim. If he's above everything, if he's above every authority, every power, every ruler, every name, and he says, this one's mine, who can, who can say otherwise? And if he says that, what should be our right response? Other than, yes, I am, and you can do with me what you will. All of Christ for all of life, no exceptions. This also means that every situation in life that we face is overseen by a sovereign power, making all things work together for good, not surprising him in the least, not shocking him at how things are going, not out of control. He is above everything and is executing his sovereign power to reign And therefore, we must order ourselves under his reign and authority. It's a weird illustration, but we often think that that this stuff only applies to big things. We 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 have a tree that's coming down. We had to find out where our septic tank was. In the process of finding out where our septic tank was, we discovered that there was a pipe that was almost all the way clogged up. uh, And it ended up being a lot more expensive than we anticipated. But through that whole process, we avoided a significant poop backup in our house (laughs) that we were very unaware of. And that's not something you want to be made aware of by surprise. Like, God's sovereignty and his control over everything, his working for his people is evident in the smallest little details if we'll see it. 
That brings us to the last point, and that is Christ's power and authority reign and rule through the church. We're told that Christ is the head over everything, including the church, in verses 22 to 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. The church is an essential part of God's plan for changing the world and bringing about the kingdom. So if we read scripture, we see that the church plays a fundamental role. Whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. We serve as representatives of Christ when we gather together as the church. Not only that, but there's... um, but, but we serve as representatives of the kingdom. We've been given the responsibility of church discipline. We've been entrusted with the ordinances of the church. We were called to fill the world with Christ's purpose and mission, and we cannot do that unless we willingly, joyfully submit to him ourselves. He is the head of the church, which means that none of the elders are the head of this church. None of the pastors are the head of this church. It means that everything that we decide needs to come from this book here with Christ as the ultimate authority. How many church arguments start because somebody decides that they're going to lay claim on Christ's church? My way is better. And I'm, I'm not even talking about within the rank and file of the church. Sometimes it's pastors too. It seems that our culture also is, as I said before, far too accepting of giving a little bit on Sunday and holding out for the rest of the week. It doesn't cost us anything to follow Jesus. And in that case, our lives and our churches don't have power because they fundamentally don't look different than anything else in the world start talking about submitting every area of your life to Christ. You start talking about every decision, every hour, every minute, everything in your life being submitted to Christ. It begins to look different, and your, your life has to display something outside of you, some sort of power outside of you for that to happen. And yes, you might look weird. You might look odd. You might be thought of an, as an outsider, but as a representative of Christ on earth, we are to live in conformity to him, meaning that every aspect of our lives should be ordered around and centered around Christ as king and Lord of our lives. It affects our priorities, our decisions, how we spend our money, everything in our lives. And it's a call of a Christian disciple to lay down everything and follow Jesus as Lord of all. That's, have you ever wondered why so many people in the Bible walk away from Jesus? Like the rich young ruler? Like he walked away sad. Like Christ offered him everything. Why? He was too in love with the world. He had too much to lose. But if you can count everything as lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, you're not losing, you're gaining. That's why Paul can say to live is Christ, to die is gain. We seem to have gotten this idea that God stopped demanding things of his people when the canon formed or when persecution stopped or when Christianity went mainstream in America. It's not true. He still demands things of his people. He still demands things of you and I. And it begins with us joyfully submitting to him as Lord of every area of our lives and increasingly measure and increasing and living in increasing measure that we might live to the praise of his glory. And the church is an instrument of transformation. And it can only be an instrument of transformation if it's made up of people being transformed. Can't offer what we don't have. Nothing is going to change in the world if it doesn't first change in the church. Because the church is the only agent that has the means of real transformation. And it has to first happen in our own lives. 
So we live in a world that doesn't like power and authority. We cherish autonomy and individualism. Yet how can we have any assurance of our salvation if we do not willingly and joyfully submit to Christ as our rightful authority? We see that Christ is the head of the church. That's an indicator of authority. We see that we are his body. We are to order ourselves properly under his authority. I think more is happening, though. In Acts 1.8, it says, we will receive power to accomplish and continue Christ's mission. We function as the visible body of Christ on earth. We are the visible manifestation of Christ on earth. And we often want Christ's power in us without submission to him. You cannot have his power without his authority and rule. And his power is manifested in glad submission to him as a head, as our head. So we can have assurance as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and God's powers at work in us, causing us to live increasingly under the lordship of Christ, becoming more like him. And ideally, when, when we're 80, we should look more like Christ, act more like Christ, have more in our, of our life in submission to Christ than we did when we were 20. But what should be the same is the commitment to having that. So it doesn't matter whether you've been walking with the Lord for five minutes or 50 years. The orb of our lives should be swayed and influenced by the gravitas of Christ, pulling us into an ever closer orbit where his power holds increasing sway as he draws us nearer to himself. That is the good life. That's the aim. That's the goal. That's the place of rest and assurance. And he is powerful to do that. Our role is to respond in faith in a thousand little things and be drawn into that joy. Let's pray.